Hi, and welcome to September 14th, Thursday I episode. This one is special for several reasons, and I want to do a brief housekeeping before we get started. My name is Alex Polkow. I'm the host of Thursday I. We've been doing this for a while, and I'm experimenting with multiple formats. And this one is going to be a very lengthy, full conversation we've had on the live recording, but very edited and uh, condensed to an hour and a half of just a lot of information. So if you're listening to this podcast on your podcatcher and you never visited us during our live recordings, this is an example of that format. Today we've covered several open source LLMs like Phi 1.5 and Bichuan, several breaking news topics. One of them was Nougat from Meta, which is an OCR to extract graphs and text from documents, which is very exciting. Another one is Coqui, which is a voice generation company. And the co-founder, Josh, actually joined us for an interview at the end of this episode. It's a text-to-speech model that can take your voice and generate a similar voice within like three seconds of audio, which is very exciting. We also covered a lot of prompt techniques and different data sets, contaminations, and had an hour interview with Killian, the author of Open Interpreter, which we talked about last week. And that interview will be cleaned up, edited, and released on a special Sunday episode. With that, I also shared some personal news you'll hear at the end. And I want to thank you for listening to Thursday I. And if you're not subscribed on Thursday I that news, I welcome you to do so because this is how you get our episodes the fastest. If you are a premium subscriber, you also receive a full length video with an audiogram and a full transcript so that you can read instead of listen. I want to thank you all for joining us week over week. This podcast has given me for the past two and a half months, a different direction. And, uh, you, the audience is the big bits part of why I do this. And so with that, I give you our conversation, a new hour and a half edited conversation. By the way, we also covered stable audio. Our friend Safrir joined us and talked about it. And the intro music that you heard is AI generated, in fact. And hopefully we'll get the authors of stable audio to join us in a later episode. So I give you September 14th, Thursday I. I think the main kind of newsmaker this week was Phi 1.5. And this is a tiny model, very small from Microsoft. And <laughs> it made a lot of noise because of the metrics that uh, it came out with were very impressive, but also because quickly thereafter, many people started like thinking about, okay, let's, uh, let's see if this is possible to fine tune. And some folks did not believe the metrics. So let's go through some of the Pi updates real quick, and then we can cover them again. So. It's a tiny model. It's a 1.3 billion uh, parameter model that tops many other 7 billion parameters. The model that you can basically, I think, run on, on your CPU. Phi uh, was a model before that we were waiting for. So 1.5 is kind of the, the, the next iteration of this. And its origins is something called Tiny Stories, which is again from Microsoft. And I think uh, there was a paper as well that talked about that quality data beats size at, at many things. And I think Tiny Stories also was the example that Karpati used when he built his Llama.c thing. Uh, over the weekend, he used the Tiny Stories to actually tell stories. Um, and Phi 1.5, uh, which I'm actually reading Young Sleep as well. And Farrell, uh, no. feel free to unmute yourself. Give us uh, a brief intro to Pi from, from you, the summary of the dot tweet, if you don't mind. Like, if no one's familiar, Phi 1 is basically this. The model behind the textbooks are all you need paper. It's a tiny model. And the really 
well, the thing that they did that was interesting at the point was basically they used uh, GPT-4 to annotate some textbook based data and then uh, they, uh, sorry, some data and then they trained the classifier on that data to be able to rank different inputs and then they used like some way to actually synthesize like that the data in, in like textbook formats and then they trained this like tiny model by overfitting it on that on that data set they used i think seven billion tokens in total for the data set size and then they uh, trained it for i think like, seven epochs or something but uh, yeah the model is is interesting of course, there's now questions about its performance uh, due to the rumors of potential like contamination on the data set. I think Sarah, Sarah, I, I don't want to mis like misremember the last name, but Sarah was came up with some concerns from like on this model and did some basic analyses and. It's not fully conclusive whether it's contaminated or not, but it does raise questions. Could you discuss the concept of contamination just a little bit? Yeah, and if you're training your your model on the benchmarks that you're evaluating it on, of course it's going to perform better, right? If you're not decontaminating your data sets, it's like cheating. And it doesn't tell us really the actual performance of the model. How could that happen? Could that happen by kind of mistake, by just not looking through the data sets? Yeah, some... it, it can be a remnant, like an artifact from from a previous data set. It, it could be a, an artifact from GPT-4. It, like, it, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, bad intentions from the, the, the researchers at all, right? Like it just could be an accident. Of course, there is the other side of things where there are definitely... People out there, they're just trying to get uh, up on the leaderboard. So uh, they might have bad intentions on that front. But I, I, I don't think that's the case with the Microsoft team. We Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Susan Zhang, I think she was previously at Meta. And uh, we're going to go and find out the tweet. She did a lot of deep dives and she is a, kind of a ball buster as well, which I like. <laughs> she turned into several things. and she. One of the la last ones, I want to remember the name of the model once Yam comes up. Yam, you just posted, I think it's from China as well. And she also looked at, at the vocabulary there. And she did like a thing where she said, I think that Pi 1.5 was trained on the benchmark, particularly GSM 8K. And the team from Microsoft, Ronen, Eldan, and some other folks actually did like a, a conversation, which is one of the reasons why I love X or Twitter. Is exactly this, right? Like the, the authors of the paper and the folks who are doing the live, like peer review, basically, they can co collaborate, discuss, even though they, they may be not agreeing on anything, but we're able to see this process live and this is uh, beautiful. And uh, so they had a back and forth. I don't know if we've gotten the conclusion. So I wanted to ask uh, Far if you saw something, yeah, I'm definitely and speak to this. I don't know if we got into a conclusion whether or not Pi was trained on the metrics. The team from I... Microsoft participating in this debate doesn't, they don't seem like the folks who like chase leaderboard just for the score. But yeah, I, I want to hear from you guys if you've seen anything um, to the effect. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just say that I don't, I, I don't have an, I don't think we, any of us have an answer. We won't have an answer unless they release the data sets, mm -hmm. which they probably won't. And even then people will start questioning it. So even if the model is very performant, like people always question that. The, from my experience, the model, it memorized very well, right? So it's been able to compress whatever information was overfitted on. But uh, once you change your prompt format slightly or the question slightly that it was like, you, you can see that it doesn't generalize very well. Now that might be just based on my own uh, questions, but I feel like that's been the case. Now there's also the other side of things is that I asked it questions that I usually ask other, other sized LLMs and 
it did answer them correctly. It answered it correctly when a 70B wouldn't answer it correctly, right? So now the question is, is it, was it trained on similar examples or does it actually have some generalizability there? I don't know, man. It's too early to tell. I'm going to keep on playing with it. Yeah. So we're going to see more kind of updates. One interesting thing that I noticed is that for, for those of you who come to Thursday I often, you guys know that we, uh, we, we had folks from News Research and hopefully Karan will join us today and talk about some updates from News Research. But definitely the folks uh, from last week, Shipole, Imozilla, aka Jeff, and Bowen Peng, and those guys are the authors of the YARN paper. Uh, YARN is yet another rope extension method, right? Uh, we've talked about rope before. It's a way to scale open large language models context window with the linear rotational embeddings. And so we have this interview. And if you're into this and you're interested, please check out Thursday I interview with them. Um, it turned out to be very good. The one thing that I want to mention in the context of Pi or Phi, I guess, is maybe far, if you remember what the context window was Pi recently with 4K, maybe a little less. Wait, for, okay. Pi is, is just 2K context window. And so yeah. I saw Tignium, a friend of the pod, Tignium, say something. When is Pi 128K? And uh, I think Imozilla said, or, or Enrico, one of the guys who like extend models to crazy sizes. And, yeah, we're already working on this. Because apparently, yeah. Phi, Phi uses rope already. And so switching from so the rope method to yarn, which is like their thing. And I think Phi joins the previous, uh, last week's tiny model thing, which is the star coder, which Anton Bakaj, the also from the bot who was there last week, talked about and fine tuned continuously. I think he kept fine tuning it after. So there's. A few tiny models, very tiny, like 1.5 is like very tiny, right? It can run on the M2 Max fairly quickly. It can run on one single GPU, etc. I think Zenova, when he joins, he'll be able to talk whether or not it's already running to transformers JS and convert it to Onyx format. Those models on code, at least on human eval and, and other things, are getting the performance of bigger models. And it's, it joined this. Kind of duopoly that we have huger and huger models from UAE and we've talked about Falcon 180B uh, last time. Uh, I think there's an additional model, you know, th this week that dropped is also like huge, but also we have a crop of like tiny models that are going to be like specific. So I don't know if uh, Phi generalizes well beyond like stories and code. I definitely know that star code that doesn't generalize well besides code, but the performance on code wise, is, at least on metrics is incredible. But the fact that you can run this locally and without sending your data, the fact that it adds to different embedding models that get released continuously. So we, uh, we're going to cover the update to embedding models as well. All of these things are just, this duopoly of huge models and getting improvements on metrics and getting trained for millions and millions of dollars in, in some countries. That definitely changes the order of things for open source, but also tiny models that we continue to see outperform huge models during this train of innovation. Also, one thing that we didn't mention, I think, but was mentioned before is that Phi has been trained on a synthetic data set from GPT-4. Is that, is that correct? Nist and Jan, Varel, feel free to chime in here. But I think that like it's all synthetic. It is semi-synthetic. The synthetic. whole premise, I, actually, I tweeted an interesting, I think an interesting summary of all of the similar method for generating rephrased, you could say, rephrased the data set. And a person that, that actually implemented all of them. So if you want the data set ready, that follows uh, the same ideas, uh, there is a list of ready data sets. The, the idea in general, uh, at least of Phi, is that uh, if you rephrase your source data uh, to look more like a textbook, uh, meaning with explanation and examples and even exercises, it really helps the model, the underlying models that are learning from this data set. Yeah, it is generated. It 
came from a model, but it is not just imagined, hallucinated from a model. It yeah. is just it is a, a rephrasing of, of a source text that you brought. So it is semi-generated. Uh, the way I see all of these methods is basically just a cleaning and just focusing the data on the important parts. But there are, there are risks for this. If you're going through a model, you have the risk of well, the model doing the model thing. I think that, I think it's an interesting direction in general. And definitely we haven't explored enough of it. And, uh, and that's what I think in general on all of these methods. And that's, uh, that's it. Yeah, let me ask you a quick question, a follow-up here. Uh, the, the, there was a concern that the, okay. uh, all of the text data on the internet, the large language models already contain and have been trained on, and there's a concern that we're going to run out of data. Is this semi-synthetic or synthetic kind of examples um, speak towards we're not going to run out of data anytime soon? Do, do you feel like this is wrong? Look, there is no doubt that... Uh, Large portions of the internet and nearly all of it was never used for training. Now, the thing is whether or not we are going to run all out of high quality data. And this is a different story. When looking at high quality data, there is a lot. There are too much trillions of high quality data. I can just point the finger to you so you can see for yourself that probably no language model ever trained on even close to this amount. But the, what people refer to as the token shortage is unique, high quality, already just ready up for you, diverse data. And to obtain a data set that is all of these together is not easy at all. And this is the main point of the token crisis arguments that it, uh, we are running out of sources to just include in general because the internet on its own is vastly larger than anything even remotely close to what we train. So it's more, it's more of we are running out of high quality and diverse data on, on different topics rather than uh, all of it. Thank you, Jans. And uh, I love when I have breaking news, but I also love specifically when I have breaking news that pertain to what you're talking about. Folks, take a look, please, at the at the at the nest or jumbotron or whatever it's called when the pin tweets are. I don't know if you guys already had a chance to see this uh, from Dr. Jim Fan. Definitely worth a follow. Hopefully, we'll be a, a panelist here on Thursday at some point. And he just posted uh, an hour ago an open source called Nougat, which is an open source o OCR model that accurately scans books with heavy math and scientific notation. And it's ages ahead of other open OCR options. And I think also from Meta. Yes, it's from Meta. Oh my God. Meta, we, we consider them the goats in open source in many things. I think at least I consider them the goats, specifically because my passion towards removing language barriers and there is a bunch of stuff in there. Obviously, Lama 2 and everything. But Nougat looks... It, it extracts not only text, which is OCR can do, but OCR is really bad at like different other notations in different areas in the PDF, or it used to be. And so now they're releasing Nougat. So yeah, Nougat is open source now. <laughs> if you can install Nougat OCR, you can do, and then get predictions for a PDF model. This is so cool. Yeah, back to your previous point about how high quality data from books that maybe haven't been scanned. Does this... Something like this, which let's say it works very well before we test this, something like this help. Look, if you want books, there are countless books on the internet already ready up for you. Ready scan. You don't. Yeah. It's not about the quantity because if you want quantity, there is quantity. The thing is that, and don't get me wrong, this OCR model is absolutely incredible. And there are countless scanned books that, that it would be 
absolutely incredible to use it for, for conversing them into a learnable form, you can say. But it, it is an infrastructure like Whisper, which can be used for transcribing YouTube videos, for example. But the thing is that you need to do it. So all of this is, I, I wish I had more GPUs to run all of these uh, ideas, <laughs> to get data, you could say. But absolutely incredible. Wow. I want to say hi to Nistan as well. What's up, Nistan? How are you, buddy? Hey, I'm good. I got obsessed the last two days making AI into a bootable Linux ISO. And uh, it crashed like 40 times. So I finally made an ISO and managed to fit the entire operating system with Python, with GGML, GGUF, Llama, CPP, all of that in under 700 megs and the UI on top. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm going to automate this and just pick like Samantha, Hermes, Platypus, or Plat but by the way, for I had some trouble with, I think it's with the model itself or like whatever the config it is loading. Wait, Nathan, you, as always, you have so much to share, but then you, you're so eager that you run through it. So let me break this down a little bit. A bootable Linux ISO, which is what, like you, you burn it into a disk or like a, a USB yeah. drive, and then you just plug this in. And then what happens? You plug it in. It uses an older Slackware Linux, but it's very efficient and it can load up the entire OS into a RAM disk. So it runs super fast. The uh, entire OS on the RAM disk? Yeah. So what? the idea is yeah, you put in a DVD. So. I'm going to, I'm adding now, I was about to release it with the Yarn Llama 128K, but it just crashed. So, and this is why I missed the space for 20 minutes. I was just obsessed with it. Anyway, it's on my hugging phase. You can just download the ISO right now. I'll be updating it. So maybe don't try it right away. I'll be updating like today or in a few hours. Yeah. So you, you put in it, let's say you got an old server. It's got like 64 gigs of RAM or 90 something. You put in literally a DVD into it. You don't need to have a GPU on the server. The 7B model in GGUF Q5 KM. So it's five and six bit. It's actually very high quality in France, it's still getting close to six tokens per second on an eight-year-old CPU, but I have an i7-6700K. Yeah, it's overclocked. Okay, fine. But uh, <laughs> it's, it, it will still get over five tokens per second. And I uh, was trying it last night. It was actually pretty usable too. So yeah. You have an old server or whatever, you throw in this DVD, it loads up the whole, you wait a couple of minutes, it loads up the whole operating system into RAM, then the system is fast. It's like faster than your Mac because there is no waiting to write anything to disk. It's all just RAM. And even updates and stuff, they, they just go. They, they just freaking fly. And it's, yeah. So you load that up and now you have a server that can do up to, if you have 64 gigs of RAM, you can do 60 K context. So yeah, you can start chugging through books or doing data generation with the seven B. This with is the no, idea. And you can do it completely offline. Completely offline with no GPU as well. That's like a, with GPU no GPU. Evolved. Yes. That's incredible. Dude. I've what? included GPU drivers, but it's a mess now and that's. I deleted them because the AMD driver was like 600. AMD driver was more than the entire system. And the system includes Python and everything. The AMD driver was literally bigger than the entire OS with all the bells and whistles for running AI in it. So yeah, I deleted that. Uh, it has some basic AMD driver and like the basic open source and NVIDIA one. But yeah, yeah, that's the, that's the idea here. You, you just load it up. That's so dope, man. What, what are your plans for this? And first of all, what beat you to work on this? And uh, second of all, because last we talked, last Thursday, you 
you wanted to run the Llama, what's that? No, Falcon 180D, right? With, with, from SSD. And then what did you to work on this and what, where are your plans going forward for this? You can run Falcon 180B with this ISL. Oh, really? Yeah. So right now, it does not include the model because I just made it into, this is the smallest one I can put in and still have all the tools. I can actually make it smaller if I just remove Python, but I'm I'm not going to, and build essentials. Yeah, yeah. you can run uh, Falcon uh, on a CPU in this. You will need more than... Uh, yeah, if you have 128 gigs of RAM on a server, you can run it. It'll run like one token per second, <laughs> so it'll be it'll be extremely slow. It's actually usable. It's usable on an eight year old consumer CPU. Oh. Yeah, so we're thinking. I was trying to convince for book to start selling AI DVDs behind, behind the black market bootleg, <laughs> and they come up to the GPU farms. AI still continues. That's basically yes, what, yes. what you AI, thought. AI can... I'm imagining Yam in like a long trench coat just opens up and there's like a bunch of CDs giving away CDs with data yes. sets <laughs> on the street. The, the AI cyberpunk uh, arc continues. Thank you for the brother. This is like incredible. Everybody should uh, watch this effort and, and contribute as well. Going back to our whole kind of continuation of discussion, Yam, you had a great tweet about Bai Chuan, and I don't know how to pronounce this. And just a tiny bit before Bai Chuan, and which I assume is Chinese, I will say this one thing. We've talked about some Chinese models like Quen and Quen uh, VL as well. And they, for some reason, were taken off the internet. And I don't know what's going on there in China, but I definitely want to hear from you about Bai Chuan. I know you have a great tweet. I'll go find it. Meanwhile, uh, could you tell us like why it's exciting, why I decided to write about this? What's interesting there? You wrote it's a big effort or major improvement. It is a large scale effort. It is large scale, well funded. You can read between the lines that there is a huge team behind it, and it's extremely detailed. And of course, it's open source, but you see the effort of thinking about what is going on in the data set that influence the model to get to the point where you have a model that is widely usable by the general public. And this is something that open source, open source individuals will have a hard time doing simply because the scale and the amount of work, something like this takes, even if you are, even if you have infinite compute, the, the work for obtaining these type of data set is insane. And the whole set of uh, experiments and results and the details that are going in this paper, it is just next step. It's just on the next. Uh, so if you don't mind, was, I'll, was, I'll, yeah, I'll maybe I ask you recommend. specific points if you don't mind sure, to sure. guide this conversation. So you wrote about unique architecture and uh, tokenizer. So they expanded the vocab size from 64,000 to 125,000. Could you briefly explain the concept of vocab specifically? Because I saw from Chinese models, they're bigger usually, right? Because maybe Chinese is also there. And maybe can you talk about the briefly what's a vocab size and how it kind of pertains to models quality? Yeah, uh, that's my uh, day to day now. <laughs> I can tell you exactly about uh, doing exactly that. Lama. And most of the popular models today are, they do have a, voca a vocabulary for different languages. However, the main, and the main focus of the models is English, of course. The thing is, in a perfect world, we could just use, for example, character level or even bytes. There are models that are, have, have been tried to use bytes. But the models that we have today, maybe because of their size, maybe because of the amount of training, but as of today, those models simply are not of the same quality. They are, they are not the same. So we, uh, we need to compromise a little bit. And the best compromise that we currently, all of us use 
is simply statistically before we train, we try to compress, you can say, we try to find the most frequent pairs and triplets and basically the most frequent substrings in the data that allows for statistically the best compression that we can, such that the model could just pull these substrings when it generates. That's basically what everyone talks about vocabulary. Now, there are specific languages that on their own, their, the amount of, of character and the amount of words, uh, unique words and unique characters is just higher. Languages are not built the same. And one of those is obviously Chinese. So there is an effort, there is a large effort going on, going on all Chinese models, both Chinese Lama and this model and other leading models. There are a couple of them, a couple of leading models. And there are large chunks of the papers that talk about the vocabulary and the choice of the specific vocabulary and how do you, how do you do it and how do you extend, let's say, Lama vocabulary to include another language, for example. Uh, I, I can tell you that uh, we have the same problem, exactly the same problem in Hebrew. Uh, Hebrew is very hard for uh, LLMs. Just and, for uh, the uh, audience, Yam, yeah, you're working on a Hebrew LLM, correct? That's yeah, the effort that yeah. you're leading as well. Yeah. And uh, the problem of, in terms of vocabulary are the same because because this is it. And the thing is the embedding layer, which is the first and the last layers in uh, generative LLMs, it's getting much, much larger when you have, when you just include more and more vocabularies. If people, if people are talking about, it makes the model heavier, probably they are talking about the extension of the embedding layer. And and yeah, it, it makes them a little heavier and that takes more and it takes more memory to run. But I think it's, this is the least interesting part of the paper. So let's move to the more interesting parts. You also mentioned uh, positional coding. You're using uh, rope for the 7B and Alibi for the 13. Interesting choice to not use the same context extrapolation method. Yeah. We're going to have to ask those yeah. folks. But, but also one thing that the, the folks from, from this research talked about is that it's funny how, because this field moves so fast, we know when rope was released, we know cause a guy and dev came up with it and then the team released like a paper. So we actually know when models started training because if they have rope, they definitely start training after rope. Oh yeah. Oh <laughs> and yeah. Also, and the, yeah. The rope scaling rope itself is far older, but the rope scaling. Yeah. It's, it's rope scaling. It's sorry, funny. Yeah. And it's like a checkpoint in our bad feelings. And now we have yarn and they haven't used yarn. So we know that they start training before yarn. So we can actually like place model training timestamps period. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Can you talk about unique wasp storm? I have no idea what this was. I never heard this term and you mentioned this. Okay. So most language models today are trained with a uh, entropy loss, which is uh, the standard loss for uh, classification where you need to classify what is the next token you just try to choose which one. On this paper, they added another term to this loss. So the model uh, also optimized. If I, I don't want to say yeah, anything wrong, so I don't have it in front of me, but as far as I remember, they added a regularization term that encouraged the model to output lower, lower values, you can say. If I remember correctly, this is following some observation that they had. There are some, on some predictions, the model output an extremely unbalanced uh, prediction, and it basically hurts the training. In general, uh, I highly recommend anyone to read the paper for themselves to read about this, but I think that just from the idea itself, I think that loss functions are unexplored, are absolutely underrated nowadays. 
there are probably uh, you, there are probably there probably are really good way to improve language models also and or maybe there are papers about different losses but there are so many papers so we didn't get to read them but most language models today are just training with the cross entropy loss and it's refreshing to see a flagship model using a different it is a powerful model for sure uh, you can see that the smaller versions 13b is uh, comparable and a little bit beyond chat gpt on uh, agi eva and uh, comparable on many other benchmarks just think what the larger versions of these models are capable of it is it is a powerful model there are there is a good chance that if we took chat GPT and reduced its size, I'm not sure that it would be comparable to it. I think that this model is extremely powerful. One thing that I noticed again, Jan, from your incredibly in-depth tweets and folks, if you don't follow Jan and you're interested in this, you're missing out because these tweets are incredibly informative. The multilingual translation and the, the bilingual data set, they, they included a bunch of stuff in the data set. One of them was a Flores 101 data set, which if I'm not mistaken, Flores is kind of a data set of, of language translation as well that Facebook used in their no language left behind to train. And so the fact that it's, it offers translation skills, we know that large language models are really good at translation, but it's good to see that it's like part of the data set as well. And pretty much this sums up, yeah, any final thoughts on this? Are we going to see this model being fine-tuned from the open source community? What, what's your expectation? I haven't seen many of the Chinese models being fine-tuned, actually, or maybe at least on English-speaking Twitter. I haven't seen many of the Chinese language models being fine-tuned. I'm mm -hmm. not sure why. They are really good. I just want to say that I, I resonate with the, with the process of this model. They are clearly deliberately going for a wide range of domains, whatever, whoever is using, is going to use this model, uh, will find uh, the model will be able to help this person, no matter the domain, no matter the profession. And, and this is <laughs> as a part of, as a part of someone that is doing this just on a different country, on a country level scale, but for a different country. It is, I think, one of the missing pieces that the open source in general is not doing. And it probably one of the processes that went into other flagship closed models that we see today. They know a lot on many topics and there is a reason for that. There is a checklist probably behind the scene. There is a checklist of domains, just like in this paper, there is a checklist for 40 domains or maybe 50 domains is a long list and you go one by one and collect high quality data on this topic and you can see for, for the first time you can see this process in detail in the paper so anyone interested in this go read the paper amazing amazing that's awesome and by domains i just wanted like highlight for our audience but domains you mean like policy and law and math and code, like all these things, they went deliberately to find super high quality data and had a bunch of other stuff in the process. So this paper is now like a checklist for how to build like a high quality model, especially for outside of the US, right? For different languages. One more thing, one more thing. It is easy to make the mistake of, okay, I need a wide range of domains. And then you go and get only scientific domains because people that train models usually come from these type of backgrounds are programming, math, scientific, and the wide range of domains we usually think about, the most crazy domains end up with medical and legal and, and scientific and programming and math for sure. But if you wanted a, a model that will be useful for seriously the general public, it is much wider than many people realize. Speaking from experience, much, much wider. People want to use the models for things that for me was just shock. I didn't even imagine. So go read the paper. In terms of training, because we've seen lately, if you include deep philosophical questions, they end up like creating 
tokens and vectors that relate many different subjects together. So those actually help. It's like that's what helped Eric Hatford's uh, Samatha model be pretty good, even with Pi or even when trained on top of a coding model. For some reason, like emotional intelligence helps with that. So I was thinking, why don't we just like full out max this out and just grab like the transcript for like, a Spanish telenovela or something and then start <laughs> using that for like, 128k training? I love just, that. Just like straight up have it relate everything that's in there yeah like coffee bean businesses and, and like someone getting shot and like whatever happens in a telenovela i haven't seen one since i was like nine but yeah, yeah we should have more emotional intelligence Important thing. one thing we know for sure and i need to give that somehow the diversity it somehow seems to be more important than the actual content there is an incredible paper about a systematic automatic testing of the pile where they train first on the whole pile and then one by one went through the sub data sets and just removed it, trained the model and benchmark the given model on anything and just show you the influence of removing each one of the component. And apart from obvious Things like if you remove Wikipedia, the model doesn't, the model uh, seems to, doesn't know many facts and things that are absolutely obvious. There were some extremely unintuitive, I don't know, influence between the data sets. The most, the strongest lesson from the paper is go for diversity. No matter what exactly content do you bring, you have to go for diversity. Diversity is king get from many different sources, but also they like always remember that it doesn't follow exactly the intuition that you think. So if we are going to include uh, many, uh, I don't know, Spanish telenovela restrictions, we have to include other things because it's going to be, it's going to be unpredictable at the end, the end result. So. I'm just saying it's a good idea. I'm just saying that you need to somehow balance it up with, I don't know, a scientific paper. So it won't something completely unrelated, just so it won't, I don't know, collapse into something. So if you guys take a look at the Ethan Malik's tweet on top, is a screenshot of a paper that talks about <laughs> how to prompt models to actually behave better. So far, we've talked about fine tune open source models, pre-training, et cetera, and the base capabilities of models. But also from the other side, we know that prompting is a whole incredible um of stuff that we're learning how to be. <laughs> if these models like Samantha, like Nissan mentioned, learns EQ, we're learning how to be the psychologist to these models and get more from them. So we have friends of the pod like Matt Schumer. Nissan has posted a couple of times his custom instructions to get the models to perform better. We know that if you ask a model to act as an expert or act with a high IQ, that tends, even uh, GPT-4, that tends to give you better results, uh, not to mention different prompt techniques like uh, re-ask and et cetera. But there was a seminal thing called let's think step by step. I want to say three years ago, two years ago, one year ago, I don't remember. Time has no <laughs> meaning at this point, but those uh, these scientists came up with a paper that says if you prompt GPT-3, uh, I think it was back then GPT-3, with let's think step by step, you actually get better performance on the same questions if you don't include this, right? And then this went into a deep hole of folks trying to find the right prompts to make your existing model, not by training, etc., but just like an existing model via inference, via prompt, to give you better results. And so Ethan posted this paper from these folks which just, like Yam said, there's a bunch of stuff that like defies intuition. So this sentence defies intuition. I think when we saw this, I saw this explode in the Twitter sphere. This tweet from Ethan has 1 million views, right? This is, how should I say, surprising and unintuitive to folks. This is not on GPT-4, so they tested this on Palm and Bison models from Google. I think one of the examples from GPT-2 by Hal Turbo. And if you can see the highlighted portion, the literal text, quote, Take a deep breath and work on this problem step by step, unquote. 
achieves a significant improvement in terms of on the, I think, GSM 8K evaluation. Yeah. So yeah. Definitely. So take a deep breath and, and, uh, and to make sure. So there's some unintuitive combination of these things, but I just love the fact that when you, there's no breath in there, but when you treat this model as, as, as something like that, I, yeah, this is like counterintuitive at all. This is, I don't get it. I don't get it, but I love it because breath is very important to us humans. <laughs> yeah. I want to hear folks on stage, like reaction to this and what do you think about these prompting techniques? Yeah. yeah go ahead. Yeah. I wish someone would go to the data set and search or take a deep breath to understand what the hell is, is going on because <laughs> it, it probably just makes the model, I don't know, just pushes the model towards uh, a probability of something in the data set because it makes no sense otherwise, but I don't know. I don't know. I can't explain this. <laughs> To me personally, I feel like it makes a decent amount of sense, but maybe this is because I've read a lot about like meditation related stuff, <laughs> but like, there's definitely a lot of text on the internet and like, I guess specifically more uh, meditation or self-improvement related that will talk about things like take a deep breath. And if you ever feel like this way, you're anxious or thoughts are racing, take a deep breath and before you make a big decision or different things like that. And so I think. It makes sense that the model would make a lot of connections like that, that it would associate taking a deep breath with becoming more coherent and more and taking something more logical after it. I think like, now that you're saying this, I think that this is the same type of influence that there is a meme that if you prompt GPT, whatever, you are an expert programmer. It makes it write better code. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah. What? What? Of course. Yes. Yeah. Just because this string is is close to better code on the internet, so it just makes the model write a code that probably is close to is on the same page as this as whatever an expert programmer writes. Just the fact that take a deep breath is a string that is associated with better performance, coming, coming down and taking things easily. I think that it actually, this is the destination for them. That's incredible. And I think it won't hurt all of us to take a deep breath from time to, <laughs> as we work on these models, definitely. But no, Luigi and Jan, what you're essentially saying is if we're asking the model compassionately to take a deep breath, this triggers some area in the model or something that puts it in a state of, be of better performance. This is what the paper says, and this is what you're speculating to because of the amount of potentially, potentially, because of the amount of internet text that says that humans perform better once their mind is clearer. That's what we're saying. That, yeah, yeah. Like, you realize like, how, how incredible the sounds right yeah or like even somebody maybe making some a post on reddit or on the internet about okay guys let me take a deep breath like we know when writing a blog post like okay i'll take a deep breath now guys and then they go on to write the rest of their blog posts and they have that section at the beginning of the blog post and then maybe that section of the blog post afterwards ends up roughly more coherent and more logical than the usual blog post without that chunk of text in it. That's interesting. I want to hear from Zafir. Uh, Zafir, welcome back. We haven't seen. Thank uh, you. Uh, yeah, great to be back again. I was on vacation and I fell off the wagon a little bit because SDXL came out and I couldn't fit it in my GPU. And that was a whole few weeks of uh, being slowed down, but I'm back in full speed. I'm working right now on something in stealth. Hopefully I'll be able to share it here in the next few weeks and expect it to be amazing. Uh, about your question, uh, let me remind our listeners something that we all know pretty well. There is no person inside GPT. It's a machine, not a very smart one, that works based on statistics. So whoever trained the model gave it whatever it needed to be able to fit like on the average case to bring somewhat good content. But good and bad are, ob are not objective definitions. 
like maybe I'm writing a book on horrible code and I want it to generate horrible code for me. So I would tell it, generate horrible code for me. When we say take a deep breath, statistically, it takes it to the direction of do something in a thoughtful way. And it puts it statistically in a way where it uh, looks around what it can generate and brings what we consider subjectively to be better. Because it's more polite, because it's more thoughtful, it's less like what a junior would write, more what a senior would write. And I love that the process around all of these discoveries is basically someone thinking of a prompt, then running it thoroughly and extensively and checking it in all those data sets and the benchmarks and getting numeric results that can prove, yes, this one sentence makes it better. But maybe we just now thought of a better sentence. So it's still very fuzzy. But for the intuition, it's just like telling it, please make me something good, or you are an expert. So now, as an expert, to predict tokens that are more statistically like what an expert would have said, and not what the average person would have said, if that makes sense for our listeners. Definitely makes sense. I want to just reflect back on what you're saying. It's definitely statistic discovery of things. I think what's incredible here is that we expect text on the internet to show examples. Like, here's an example of how a, a junior developer would do this. And here's a senior. Like, we've seen more and better, like, answers on lead code, for example. Like, that was part of the training. Here, the breath part puts us humans at ease because, like, obviously, the, effort, the benefits of meditation is well documented and no. But to have it perform better on code, I think GSM is code. I'm not sure. If somebody can correct me. But to have it perform on tasks better, by asking for the step by steps, jumping from one area of, let's say, the text on the internet to another, right? Like jumping from, if you meditate, you'll have a better smile on your face and you'll be less angry towards you also be able to perform better on tasks. And the fact that it puts the model in that space, at least the Google model, right? This, I, we don't know if this is generalizing. This was on Palm V2. I think that's just, just. So outside of the many folks' intuition, this stuff like wildfire and was worth a discussion. I think we had Junaid. I don't know if Junaid, you want to come up to talk about this or not, but Junaid is also a frequent person here on the Thursday I. He said that there could be like LLM psychiatry, psychologist as, as a whole field. From psychologist, from therapist. I love all this. Yeah. I want to bring Junaid up real quick to react to this. And then we're going to move on. So Junaid, are you already connected? Yeah, come up, say hi, and then uh, yeah, tell us about <laughs> what you think of this. Hey, yes, I. This doesn't surprise me at all, actually. And the reason is, is that, that we keep calling these things models, but when you think about what they really are, it's idea spaces. These are idea spaces, and the, I, I keep coming back to this. If you're working on prompts, you have to have a certain understanding of just like broad human psychology in order to get the most out of a model because the model is broad human psychology. It's so I, I don't think it's surprising at all how important things like priming the pump with pretend you're an expert or you are an expert or be calm and, or think logically or think through this in a couple of steps. Of course, we're going to end up aiming at a place in the model that is a little bit better than if you tell it, hey, think like you're a moron and then attack this same problem. It's going to end mm -hmm. up at a, at a completely different place in the idea space than if you prime that pump with, okay, start with we're aiming at good stuff, not bad stuff, right? So it's, if anything, I think it's more indicative of like, how amazingly it's able to pick up nuance by training on language. That to me is amazing. Absolutely. So I think we're including this incredible prompting techniques here. Folks are welcome to check out the, the pin tweet to, to dive in more deeper. One thing I'll say is that some folks from the pod, from friends of the pod, they have a custom prompt that says, think quietly, and that also works well. And uh, yeah, I'll let Jan maybe put a bow on this and then we'll continue to the next yeah, topic. I, I just want to say that 
first. Absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's statistics of uh, what might be the next completion of the work, the text, and the models just want to complete. They don't want to help you. They want to complete the text. So first you need to tell them when you complete the text, complete it in the, with the right solution. Because when you see problems, sometimes you see wrong solutions from the internet. Human, humans make mistakes. So you can predict the wrong solution. It's fine. This is exactly what the model wants to do. So just we as humans, we prefer the right solution because we have some bias, human bias. One thing I want to add is that it is not just statistics and on the training set itself, uh, uh, prompt engineering goes more than that because things like let and uh, think step by step are not just making the model, priming the model to go for a, a certain, a certain, you can say a region in a training set where things are written step by step. It is also, uh, there is a chain reaction that after you write the step-by-step -step, uh, solution or steps for solving a problem, now you have it in the prompt and based on this, the model is now solving the test. So it, uh, it is even more uh, amazing when you think about it. It's not just that, okay, we need to look at the training set and just guide the model towards this part of the training set because this is the style or the thing that they want, is that there is a an unpredictable chain reaction because you predict each time the next token based on everything that came before. So it's amazing things like step by step, let's think step by step. And, and there is sophistication for prompt engineering that is unpredictable from the training set because of those conditional predictions each time. So it is important to take it into consideration because step by step is amazing and moreover, it works with whatever model and whatever size. So this is also an incredible thing. Uh so, hey folks, everybody who joined recently while we were talking, welcome to Thursday I. We're here every Thursday. There's a panel of experts here. I'm Nistan, Yam, Porel, Junay, Luigi LDJ, and uh, we're joined by Kia. It's a free who I haven't seen in a while. And we have a new guest here, Killian, uh, Robin Killian. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more in depth with Killian in, in a few minutes uh, about uh, maybe the top open source project on GitHub, or at least one of the highest ones uh, for the past week and how that's been. So before we get to that interview, I just want to give a few points about just logistic points about Thursday app. So first of all, we're here every week. We're staying up to date, so you don't have to. That's the model. I'm Alex Volkov. I'm the, the, the host here. I also uh, maintain a newsletter for Thursday. So if you missed anything, you will have a recording and a summary. I welcome you to go and uh, register for that. We've been doing this since GPT-4 was released and it's really fun. And it's been just unimaginably incredible to me how many very smart folks from different areas joined us, right? So we have folks who train and fine tune LLMs. We had a few conversations and deep dives with the folks at the top of the charts of open fine tunes. So folks like GarageBand, folks behind Platypus. We see, I see alignment in the audience, say Austrian. So folks who released like Open Orca and obviously news research and folks who extended Llama to 128K and uh, the authors of Yarn Paper. This, is, this has been an incredible place for the community to meet. I'm very happy for this. Honestly, I'm really humbled by the amount of talent that, that decides to join and talk about these updates every week. And we try to give a balanced view. It's okay for us to not have the same ideas about different things. A lot of this is new. A lot of this is, we're just like, many of the times we just react in real time. Like we just did for two breaking news today. And we're going to have another breaking news today as well. And so for the first part, we usually do updates. So we just cover everything that we noted that's interesting for the past week. If you're in the community and you come back here every week, you're also welcome to help with this. I just leave a comment under a new thing that releases with like hashtag Thursday I or tag at Thursday I uh, pod, and we'll definitely add this. The more of you add something, the more the signal of this is an interesting thing for us to talk about. And with that, I want to just share like one last thing personally. I think I've been waiting to, to, to say this. 
I'm a CEO of a company called Targum Video, and I did not imagine that I'm going to be managing a podcast and a newsletter even two months ago. Uh, literally, just people told me, hey, where's the recording of this? Why, we can't make it. Why are you doing this early morning on Thursday? We're, we're busy. And so people were just like, hey, recording. And I just said, okay, well, where's the best place to do this? And then went to Substack. So first of all, you're welcome to also join that newsletter. Feel free to. But it's been, again, unimaginable personally for me how much folks in our industry need something like this, the space. And I've been invited to multiple things. And so one thing I would love to share with you guys personally is that the conference AI Engineer, which is in San Francisco on October, I want to say 9 to 11, is hosted by Friends of the Pod Swix and the guy behind the kind of the seminal essay about the AI engineer, Swix has joined the Clears the AI from time to time as well. And they invited me to be a media person at the event, something that I did not ever consider to be because of the Thursday iPod. And so I'm going to be in San Francisco covering and doing spaces from that event as well. And I cannot be more excited that Thursday I led me to this kind of weird movement forward in my career. And so those of you who are in San Francisco during this, if you're in San Francisco, if you're in this AI engineer event, I would love to chat with you. I'm going to have microphones there. I'm going to have the whole nine yards. And uh, we're going to have spaces from there as well in the purpose of bringing folks that can't attend the San Francisco event just to have the feeling of the event. That's what I'm going to be in charge of. So definitely if you're, if you're, watch out for those spaces that are coming up. I'm really excited about this. And I want to thank everybody here on stage and in the audience for pushing this along personally for me. With that, I think we're going to move to the next thing. So we I want to talk about audio. And I know you've, you've looked at this and you've DM'd me. One of the things that we obviously cover here is multiple modalities in and out, right? So the, there's models that can take modalities in, like image, text, audio as well. And those models, they can output different modalities. The rise of AI video we've talked about, images we've talked about, audio has been lagging behind a little bit, maybe potentially because there's a lot of licenses involved in music. And uh, Stable Diffusion has released Stable Audio. And so we have Safir here, who actually DM'd me about, hey, let's talk about this. So Safir, welcome. Please tell us what Stable Audio is. Gladly, thank you. And so first of all, you mentioned video. I've been working on video for the past 10 years, and I can tell you it's never really video. It's always audio video. So you have the AV club, you don't have the V club. Because to look at a moving picture, you also expect to hear a moving sound. I've been playing around this space recently, around looking what the options are, and I got into the music gen fine-tuning rabbit hole and spent quite a few nights recently fine-tuning music gen. Meta's music gen allows to generate audio clips directly of up to 30 seconds, and it can do even uh, more in similar to image. So let me first review what we had so far. So we had a music gen, which is a custom model that creates tokens in a special language of called encodec which was basically implemented first as a music compression algorithm. So the idea was, hey, we can take music, compress it to tokens, then decompress it back to music. And the next step was, hey, we can actually predict these tokens. So that works interestingly well. We also have proper diffusion models, just the same diffusion idea, the noise until you get something that matches the training set. And for example, the new stable audio is a diffusion model. And there was one team, I forgot its name, that they actually used a proper image model. And they trained it on images of audio spectrograms, spectrographs, which show which frequencies are at each sample of the sound. And just by uh, recreating images and then converting them back to audio that gave a somewhat musical result. And we, I talked about the 30 second of uh, music gen. So this week we got Stability's AI's new stable audio, 
And that does 45 seconds on the regular plan and 90 seconds on the pro plan. And they claim to offer even more on the enterprise. I'm hoping I'll be able to learn more about that. And I want to share about the results of this. So it does uh, pretty interesting things. When we're talking about music, it's always important to understand what we wish to create. So the music that you hear while sitting at a concert is not the same music that you want when you're in a club. And that's not the same music you want when you're traveling in an elevator. So there are a lot of use cases and a lot of people are trying to judge the results by, oh, it's not good music. But not all music needs to be good music. Sometimes you just need to accompany a video. There's a whole industry of music for YouTube videos, for example, that wants to stay back and let you talk over it and have people understand what you're saying. And, but the results right now are almost interesting. I'm saying from a musical perspective. So it's not boring and loopy as you'd expect. It does develop musical ideas and split into parts and segments and the chorus and an intro. And I would like to maybe get back to you after a few weeks of playing around and learning all the prompt engineering tricks, similar to what we discussed now. I'm sure there is a magical world that can make any song sound amazing, if I can just find what that world is. And I also wanted to consult with the room about the problem. I know not everyone agrees with me, but I see the problem of audio generation as much more difficult than text generation. So let's say, for example, let's take the example of, please write a speech by the president of the United States. So that's a text, right? Then I could have a different model and ask it, please make an audio of the words spoken in a speech by the president of the United States. So that's all of those words with all the context and interconnections between them. But on top of that, you have tonality, you have emotions, you have stressed words, and two, pe two separate people could say the same speech in a whole different interpretation, right? So that's another level. And if you're asking generally, give me an audio recording of a speech by the president, then it's everything I just discussed, plus the noises of camera shutters, people talking in the background, breathing sounds, a lot more contextual in information. Maybe it's raining outside. So a lot of these micro informations that we as humans, that's like a basic part of how we interpret the world around us, the way that we hear sounds, the way that the, the voices reverberate to give us an idea of the size of the room. So a lot more information in each layer that we're talking about. So this task that all of these companies we just mentioned are taking on themselves is actually in my mind, much more difficult than what we can expect. I wanted to get some input from the room on that. Um, thank you. Awesome. So for, first of all, you said quite a lot of stuff and I just want to First of all, thank you for coming up and giving us this summary. Definitely welcome to come back after you play with this a little bit. I want to just join that I, so I, I connect with many of the points that you said, specifically about fronting. Every time a new model, especially for a new category comes up in a new field, that the, the whole prompting thing is different, right? So we remember Stable Diffusion a year ago, you had to be almost an art major to even know how to prompt this. And many folks used many like living artists, which like created the whole anti AI art movement. People could just were using artists and because that those artists work was part of the data set, then you could put the model in a better like location, the latent space to give you higher quality. Greg, I forget the, uh, Greg's last name, but those are famous artists that li literally everybody used back then. And then this whole field created more, st more ethically sourced, let's say, data sets for SDXL and different models as well. I want to highlight the fact that a stable audio is trained on fully commercially licensed kind of audio, right? So like they've learned their lesson from last time. And so not only is it trained like from commercially like available data set that they definitely have the rights to, and nobody can come and say, hey, you're my music off, hopefully, but also it's commercially licensable. So the free tier, I don't think, but the the paid tiers, you can use this music in commercial settings. 
This is also, I think, fairly new. I don't think this is the case with the Meta uh, Music Gen or the Google Audio LM software, I think. Uh, so I don't think that that's the case in both of those. And I think this is like a big deal for many folks because you can literally use this in like movies if you produce movies. In addition to that, I think you've added about prompting. And so I just want to point to the Jumbotron. So Databots lead, led audio in Stability AI. I don't know if like they still lead this or not. Definitely involved in the process. Uh, I wanted to, to have the Databots come on the stage, CJ, and then talk about this maybe at some point. But he posted for a great blog with prompt trick. Because again, like with, state, with all our diffusion models, where you had to learn different styles, of camera and lenses and, and different things and w w what have you. Now we're going to step into, okay, what is synth? What is like chill wave? Like all, what, what are these, like all these things in music? And so what this connects to me into is all those specific models beyond the text, which we all write and speak text, the specific models will benefit the folks who are already in this area, right? Not replace, but definitely help. And so Definitely exciting. I played the sample in the beginning before you entered. I, I did like two samples. The website was really slow yesterday. Hopefully they're going to, to unblock all of this, but it sounds good. And I've, I've heard like other things that sound okay. This sounds good. And again, like we always say, it's only the start. There's also the point about open source with stable audio. Obviously stable diffusion is known for dropping a, an open source on all of us in the world you just have to deal with this. And they've opened the sh they've opened the floodgates basically a year ago with dropping like this powerful model because Dali was around and I think Imogen uh, back then in, inside Google was still not released and they just said hey world take this and do whatever deep fakes you want with it right uh, and now they they not changed course but they didn't release this model by default as open source so that's interesting they released like a SaaS model that they will get paid first. And they did talk about dropping this at some point with open source. And so I think that's also worth mentioning and interesting. And folks on stage, feel free to react to that. And so for your last point about how big of, a, of an effort here to generate something that's like uh, close to live, we actually had, um, hopefully they'll be able to join. We had Josh from Kokui, that they released a model today that does many of these things, background sound, birds singing in the background like by, by so uh i i couldn't find the link i think they just released it on discord um coqui ai so coqui.ai they just released open source a full model today that that does many of the stuff so far that you've talked about specifically not in music audio but in in people talking areas and also songs so now we have ai that can generate music well but also AI that can generate sounds well. And I don't have a tweet to pin, unfortunately, because I didn't have a lot of time to play with the model, but I'll definitely follow. So I'll send that once it's available. The server is, I can maybe pin the server. I don't know if folks on stage have reactions to stable audio and how diffusion differs from how we treat LLMs and that thing. On that topic, I think two additional websites and resources for you guys to check out. One is definitely Bart from Suno that generates, I think, music and people talking with noise in the background. It's trained on different data sets. That, that one is interesting. And the second one, obviously, is Kokui. I added the Kokui text on top for a multilingual thing. 11 Labs, like Genex said, we all know they generate very true to life AI voices. I even use in Thursday, I, the, the short form podcast, there's this recording that we have that you can always subscribe to, but this is three hours unedited. Not many people have time for this. Thursday has also like a short form podcast, which I record the intro to, and then the rest is generated with AI. I think they use 11 labs. Coke, we released that open source, basically. The, the tweet on top is not that. They still haven't released the tweet. So you got, you guys got some alpha. I hope I'm not leaking anything. But I think it's okay. And uh, those two are new to the scene. And we're going to see prompt engineering tricks there as well. Hey, say this with emotion. Say this with like serious tone and uh, different things like this. With that, I want to kind of 
finish the updates portion. Updates portion. One, oh, one last thing that we had, Ian Moore from the audience. Ian, thank you so much. So folks, as we talk, we have breaking news. This one last thing that I want to find from Nomic AI. If you don't know what Nomic AI is, they, the guys, they have, what the name of the product. They have a product that like shows embeddings, visually yeah. embeddings in different space, like millions of embeddings. Nomic okay. Atlas, Matt. Atlas, thank you. When you have a bunch of embeddings, Atlas shows, is able to visualize those areas and neighborhoods, right? You can think about vector search or retrieval augmented generation. Atlas is the way to visualize this so you can see different things. So Nomic AI also has this additional thing called GPT for all. GPT for all is basically a way to run every model from the open source or every GGUF, GGML model, whatever on your Mac. And it's a very easy way to do this. So you don't have to think about environments. You don't have to download many things. Uh, and uh, they released something today, just literally a 43 minutes ago that Ian posted for us. So I'm going to top, uh, pin this to the top of the tweet. It's called GPT for all Vulkan and it's accelerated quantum interface on edge GPUs, um, whatever that means. So they claim that they have a faster than open CL, uh, uh, inference and works out of the box on windows, Mac and Linux, and definitely worth a shot. And especially if you don't know, GPT for all is a, a great way to test all these models that we talk about open source wise, especially the smaller ones. If you have a Mac and one and two GPT for all runs in front of GGF models and quantized models and like all of these things. So it's like a chat interface that you can literally go to Hugget Place, download the model and tell it like, Hey, use this for inference and you'd be able to chat with it. So you don't have to wait for demos and Hugget Place. So we love Nomic and this is shout out is not in no way sponsored. And I just want to shout out Ian for bringing this breaking news to us. If you hear breaking news and you want to also bring this, we love breaking news, please give us. And I want to turn over to breaking news, folks. This is a little bit out of my depth, but we've planned for this one. I've talked about Koki. We've talked about how generating audio is a problem, generating sound is as a problem. And so I want to welcome the stage, Josh. Josh, feel free to please first introduce yourself without talking about what we're talking about. But just as a general intro for folks, because this is recorded as a podcast as well. Welcome, Josh. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Can you hear me okay? Awesome. Uh, yeah, stoked to be on today. It's been crazy. <laughs> My name is Josh, uh, Josh Meyer. I'm one of the founders of Koki. We work on generative voice and we're building kind of core foundation models for generative voice. We've been doing it for a while, back before they ever called them foundation models and back before it was ever generative and it was back just synthetic speech. Yeah, long story short, <clears throat> I've been working in the language technology world for a little bit over a decade now. Me and my co-founders, we used to be the machine learning group at Mozilla, and we were working on open source uh, speech recognition, like text, speech to text, and also open source speech synthesis, what people are calling voice generation now. We worked on that at Mozilla for a good amount of time, I think maybe somewhere like four or five years. And basically our project was getting so much traction that we thought, you know what, why don't we, why don't we spin out? Why don't we, why don't we take it out? Why don't we get some more resources, buy a lot more GPUs and really do something, do something cool. About two and a half, three years ago, that's exactly what we did. We've been building models and the tech around it since, and this the news today is something that I've been really psyched about for a while, which is we're open sourcing or releasing with the model weights for our kind of core production voice generation model. It, it speaks 13 languages. It's pretty easy to fine tune it to new languages. It can clone voices with as little as three seconds of audio and one of the cool parts of it is given it's got this kind of <clears throat> gender diffusion at its core, you can have a lot of variation in the model, which is, uh, which is fun. It's also difficult for anybody who's worked with generative models, right? Like getting it to actually do what you want. But, but yeah, um, that's, uh, that's a pretty short intro. Uh, 
to be here. I'm going to have to probably jump in the next 10 minutes just because today is craziness. The, the model release went live, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes ago. So uh, it's, just, it's, just, it's just pretty hot off the press. Yeah. Thanks so we, uh, so Josh, first of all, thank you for that intro and exciting. I've used Koki before. I think I saw a demo of a phone call maybe and Koki was included in that um, and it was like very fast. And obviously there's like commercial stuff as well. I, yeah, I want to be mindful of your time. So I'll briefly ask a few questions. What made you guys open source this? So many companies, Tortoise, they released it, but it didn't open source the kind of the fine tuning. Play.ht and the 11 labs are like people use them all the time. And I think open sourcing this is bold and very brave. And I want to commend you on it. But what made you guys open source this? And how are you thinking about the kind of the risks versus the rewards of the technology like this? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that so there's risks in terms of kind of the the ethical security concerns, right? I very much believe that we are able to get ahead of the the ethical and the security problems the more open the core technologies are. For example, if a company has a closed source voice generation and voice cloning, and they also have a closed detection system, they got an API for detecting what's synthesized audio, what's real audio, that's good to a certain extent. But if we're really going to make this something that's just electricity, that's just something that we take for granted, and I think that this kind of AI technology should be that, how do you say? I want to say permissive, that's not the right word. Something that's just everywhere, something that we don't even think about. Um, like something, yeah, ubiquitous, exactly. It needs to be. It needs to be open at its core. So I think that the more open the core tech is, the better we are to get ahead of the problems. And also, because keeping a closed source creates this kind of um, economic situation where basically the rich people in the rich countries get access to it, and nobody else does. So that's one side of it. <clears throat> Another side of it is my personal view is with AI. It's all moving open source. It's, we've seen what's happened in the image space with stable diffusion. We've seen what's happened in the, the tech space with, with Llama and Falcon and all these other model variants, right? It's, it's happening in every space. It's inevitable. And I think that there's a need for a leader on the open side of things. And we've been doing open source for so long it just feels right. It's like in our blood. We were, we were doing open source before we started doing commercial. And now it just it, it makes sense to us. We know how to work with open communities. And, but it's hard also for generative models because in terms of licensing, I, I don't know, I don't want to go off too much of a tangent here, but just like finding a good license for a generative model is really hard because what people usually do is they look at like, open source initiative licenses that were made for code. Like they look at MIT, Apache, GPL. And if you actually read those, they're not made for models. They're made for code. Something that you can go in and change and have a kind of creative input. And then also people will release models under kind of these creative commons licenses, which are not made for something that's machine-like. Uh, they're made for content. They're made for photographs and music and they talk about derivative works and so we we put a lot of time i can't tell you how many hours we've had on licensing discussions and we ended up uh a collaborating a really awesome lawyer for open source licensing in, in particular to create a new license that we think is much more straightforward that includes not just the model but the model outputs so there's no kind of ambiguity there but yeah, that's a bit of a tangent. So I'm sure there's other things that you would be interested in talking about. And yes, and I have a question for you, but tangents are always appreciated specifically for <laughs> guests who just release something. But I do want to be mindful of your time as well, because you probably have the same thing going forward. Could you give us like a summary of the technical stuff that was released that maybe unlocks like new capabilities for folks in terms of open source? So one thing I'm thinking of is Tortoise mm -hmm. was there, but it was notoriously slow, for example. And we know yeah. for real-time applications, speed is like very important. Could you give us like a summary of the, the stuff, the juice, the, like what do you release and what we can now use? Yeah, I'll be honest. I'm not the best one on my team to talk to that. Maybe you can talk to 
can get on your show, Aaron, who's the, the real brain of the making the model. But basically, there's a few issues with with current models out there. There's one is speed, but one is ability. Like if you create a voice, uh, a lot of times there's this kind of I say speaker embedding, and over the course of the generation, the impact of that embedding vector can how do you say <clears throat> wither go away so you can start synthesizing a sentence and it sounds like one person but by the end of the sentence it sounds like a different person that was a technical hurdle that we overcame and also the multilingual aspect i yeah i can't talk too much in more detail than that maybe you can get aaron on the show but those are some of the big headaches that we had to deal with yeah we would love to just in terms of speed just to connect the dots how performant are we to expect this thing on a GPU or on the CPU? Yeah. Like, is it open for UIs generating TTS in real time based on, let's say Killian here on the show is the, mm. the author of Open Interpreter. Could now integrate XTTS to speak out things? Yeah. If you've got a modern NVIDIA GPU on your machine, like a 3090, it, this will be like blazing fast. We have... It, it's also, it's always very much a dance of, we want to put out the core model because of the quality aspects and the cloning and the multilingual aspects, but also we do have some extra, we do have some extra latency improvements on our end, like streaming output. We've, we had a breakthrough with, and that's not actually in this release, but in terms of just, if you install this and you're using this and you've got a 3090 on your computer. It's pretty fast. I don't have numbers on latency, but it's, yeah. I just want to share that if, if there is a place that people can take a model that runs on 3090 fast and make it run on the CPU fast, this is this place. So Josh, yeah, mindful of your time again. How can we test this? How can we play with this? Where should yeah. we follow? Yeah. Where should we join all of this thing? Okay. So I'd say there's two avenues. One I didn't even mention that we, we collaborated with Hugging Face on this release. We've got a hugging face space together that's that's very nice and performant and has nice GPUs on it right now. <clears throat> so if you go to a hugging face Koki's space, it's like hf.co slash spaces. That's where you'll find it. No need for install, right? You can just try it out right there. But also if you want to try it locally, just do pip install TTS and and you're off. That's <laughs> It's, it, yeah, it's pretty easy. I, I think I'm going to have to jump at this point. There's probably some fires I need to put out. Absolutely. Thank <laughs> you so much for joining. Congrats yeah. on the release. And uh, yeah, you're welcome to send any folks from, from Cochrane here to Thursday to talk yeah. about details, technical details next week. Thank you for coming up. Thank you. Bye. All right, folks. As you heard, we got some breaking news. Not only do we have breaking news, we also have folks who read the breaking news. In this case, Josh joined from Koki, but also VB, who's a, a fairly frequent panelist here from Hugging Face, who worked on together with them on this release, uh, has also participated in this release. I want to summarize. I don't know if I can summarize. We've been at this for, what, three hours, I think? Started slow, but whoa, did this pick up. We've talked about Phi 1.5, talked about stable audio. Thank you, Safir, for joining and talking to us through this. We're waiting for your results afterwards. We've, we've talked about... We didn't talk about Mojo Lama, but I will shout out our friends, Latent Space, who just literally just dropped an interview with Chris Latner, and definitely go check this out next. I think we're just, the webinar for Mojo is also happening. And then we had an incredible interview with Killian about Open Interpreter. Killian, thank you so much for joining us and talking to us about this. So that interview, I'll clean this up and it will be released as a separate Sunday pod. Hopefully I'll have some time. It's my daughter's birthday today, so we'll see. But it will be released in a second separate, but expect the, the news and the links and everything we've covered, including a recording of this long space to come out by the end of the day. And then we had a bunch of breaking news. One big one is the XTTS from folks at Kokui and in collaboration with Hugging Face, where you can clone your voice in under three seconds of recording, and then it has like emotion transfer, it's multilingual, and it's incredible. And then we're talking about policy as well, not including multiple other stuff. With that, I want to just extreme thanks and love to all of you for joining this every week. It's been 
transformative in my personal life. And I know for other folks as well, I know some folks here, Mr. You, you said the um, user and alignment, right? If, if I'm not mistaken, we've talked about this a little bit. And uh, there's folks here who like jump from one Discord to another and we all collaborate. And uh, if I have a tiny sliver of things to do this and given the space for folks here on stage, and I'm very happy about this. With that, I want to just say, follow us Thursday.news. We have a website. There's a short form pod and there's a long form recording of all of this. Help is needed in terms of like, just share everybody here on stage, follow them and share their stuff, but also definitely boost us up because uh, Twitter is deducing some of the posts from social reach. And uh, beyond that, listen to recordings, come back every week. We're here, we're staying up to date. So you don't have to, and even if you are up to date on a specific field, like Yam and Nissan and I are in uh, different fields, other fields are also interesting and the cross pollination between ideas is also incredibly important. We've seen between diffusion models and large language models and lores and everything. So definitely come be a part of this community. And if you are, I really appreciate being a like, new welcome. With that, I want to close this Thursday. I will meet you next week. I expect many more things to launch today. Yeah, I saw breaking news from your tweet. We just don't have time to cover this. Uh, next week, we're going to talk to Zenova and uh, Arthur in the audience about some web GPU excitement stuff. Until then, I bid you a great week and a great AI week. And uh, yeah, follow Thursday for the recordings of all of this. Cheers, folks. Have a great one. Bye-bye.